today we are starting unit 4 trade and globalization those of you who do not have the book the pdf file is also there you can download it the only problem with this pdf file is that they have forgotten to upload half the book so you have page 155 and then you have page 157 there's no page 156 no page 158 even numbers are left out anyway that's uh, not really a problem so we will take it slow we'll take it about one one and a half page per day the pace is quite okay in july we have covered more than half the syllabus at this rate in another two three months we should cover it there's no point going really fast right now so we'll go slow and steady so this topic unit 4 trade and globalization in a way i'm relieved and happy we are out of unit 3 if you remember unit 3 it was a little bit of a kitschery there was economics you had history you had civics you have political science so for a teacher as well as a student it was a little confusing still then i think uh, the main point of the last unit three was industrialization how industries began in europe particularly england and how it spread across the world and how it affected india also so this is unit four it mainly takes place around the mid 19th or early 19th century even till now globalization impacts everyone for example what we are doing this morning is also in a sense a form of globalization through this software or through this application zoom we could have been in any part of the world and we are all connected together at the same time the first thing to note is the expansion expansion is the growth how does it grow it spreads from one part to another part and to another part. If you look at the picture in this modern world that we live in today, there is no part of the world which is not connected. Every part is connected. But we need to look at the beginning, how it all begins. This is the point of learning history. Now what we call a world market, actually it took place many years ago, just that now it has become faster. For example, India was a market for many things. Indians made good ships, they had very good quality of cotton, silk, they had precious stones. They were very expert in making metals, especially iron. And people from all over the world traded. Only difference is that it took them perhaps a couple of months to cross the seas and to reach India. To return back to their places, it would take another couple of months. So this process actually of trade and exchange started many, many years ago. On a worldwide scale, you had the finished product, something that is already made either by hand or by some kind of machine. And it also could be food or other natural resources. The industrial revolution, which we studied in the last chapter, only accelerated or made that process very fast you had machines taking the place of manual labor now this enabled some economies not all some means a few so you had england you had france germany maybe you had austria the markets became saturated and they started to look to expand outside now let me explain this point with a simple example maruti is the indian company what is the the other company suzuki suzuki is correct where is suzuki from japan Japan is correct. So you have a Japanese company and it is assembled in India, Maruti Suzuki. So you have so many examples, globalization. So this is how globalization has spread across the globe. So they don't just confine themselves to one market. So basically what started in a few countries, now it has spread all over the world, but it did not happen overnight and now it has been a process which affects everyone including us a simple definition of markets if you look at this picture do you find something strange uh, or something yeah like moon cell yeah. 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 So, what do you find strange in this picture one is giving uh, alu another is giving something else oh there yeah, is exchanging goods to goods yes what is it called Barter system. Very good. This is the barter system where you exchange goods for goods. But this also takes place in a market. So market is a place where buyers and sellers 
can meet to facilitate or to enable the exchange or transaction of goods and services. Now in the beginning, when markets started, there was no money involved. You exchange one good for another. So they would have a mutual understanding. Money came very recently, even in India itself, in the past, you see, gold. So in the past, they would exchange with gold. Now this is also one of the reasons why India became so rich. So in the beginning, transaction did not involve money. Money came later on. But when money came, it became a convenient mode of transaction. Now markets can be physical. It can be also virtual. Physical markets are the physical goods which you can actually see, you can feel, you can touch. Those of you who go for vegetable shopping, it's natural that you touch and see the vegetable or the fruit or the fish or the meat. You see it and you measure it, you weigh it, you are satisfied, you pay for it. Now the other thing that is happening now is the virtual e-commerce or the e-retail. Let me give you an example of virtual. Amazon. Amazon. And there are others also. You can have an idea. You can see it, what it looks like. And you have an idea of the price and you can pay for it also. You can buy it. So this is a market, but it is not really real. It is a virtual market. So you have two kinds of market. The main markets are the physical markets where you go and you actually see that product as it is and then you buy it or you go online in a virtual space. Now, there are also other markets like the black market, the auction markets and also the financial markets. What is the black market? You would, let's say, for example, in Manipur, we see a lot of it. Sometimes when there is a band or a blockade, you have people sitting outside the petrol pumps in these small plastic bottles selling petrol. Is it really illegal? It's not legal. It's illegal. But there's a demand for it. So they sell it. Now, if the price of petrol was, let's say, 70 or 80, they would be selling it for 100 or 120, more than the price. But people still buy because the demand is there. Right? So this is the black market. It's not official, but there is a demand for it because the supply is less. Next is the auction markets where the buyer competes with another buyer and the buyer who puts the highest price wins until everyone else surrenders. The highest bidder wins. Going to the highest bidder or the one who offers the highest price. The next part is the financial markets, the stock exchanges, where the exchange is not in vegetables or fruits or cars or anything else. It is on the shares or on the market value, the debentures, the stocks of that particular company. Now, this is also a huge market going in millions and billions. These are quite unstable. Sometimes value goes up, people make lots of money and when it crashes, goes down people also lose lots of money the next what is the function of the market market established or it somehow fixes the price of goods and services that are determined how is it determined by supply and demand the demand for food products eggs milk rice is always increasing because population is increasing now other things the price will fluctuate as per the demand. For example, in winter, there is a demand for jackets, for blankets. But in summer, the demand is less. People don't really need a sweater or a jacket. So the price goes down. And company shops make offers 20%, 30%, 50% discount. Buy one, get two free, something like that. So this is the dynamics of the market. Actually, this would have been part of economics and it's part of the real khichri but then I'm happy this chapter has come because we are mainly talking about economic. Let me be more precise. This is part of economic history. So we're looking at economics as well as history. We're not confusing civics or political science or geography or other things. Okay, this is a real market. This is a place called John Beale Mela. This takes place in Morigaon district, just near Guwahati. This year, it has already taken place. It takes place normally in January. The hill tribes, let us say, uh, from neighboring Meghalaya, and they meet the plains, plain people of Assam or the Assamese, and they exchange, they have a feast. It's something like a, a reunion for them. So these are pictures of this mela. It's a very famous mela. It takes place every year. 
called the John Beale Miller. Now this has been going on since the 15th century AD. This is one of the traditions that has been revived in Assam and in Manipur also I think it would help, it would be helpful if some traditions like this would be revived for some kind of economic or market interaction. These are examples of how relationships can improve among communities. The next point as per the book, we have to go by the book. We are looking at two economic theories. One is laissez-faire and the other is mercantilism. So this is a clash between these two theories. Now what is this theory all about? Or you could say this is Adam Smith versus John Maynard Keynes. Not really as simple as that. Actually Adam Smith did not invent laissez-faire and John Maynard Keynes also did not invent mercantilism. But Adam Smith supported or wrote very strongly for laissez-faire and John Maynard Keynes wrote very strongly or he advocated or supported mercantilism. The basic idea of laissez-faire versus mercantilism is laissez-faire talks about free market. Everyone should be free. Now mercantilist policy in a way it's kind of a very narrow-minded or very closed policy. Not many people support it nowadays but at one point it was there, we can't ignore it in history. Now what was the plan or the design? The design is simply to benefit the government and the commercial class or the businessmen. Now where did it start? It started in Europe. Now this is a definition for class 10. You would need to remember memory points. It's remember three points. Firstly, it is a European economic theory and system. It supported establishment of colonies. For example, India was a colony of England. Vietnam was a colony of France and so on and so forth. So colonies had to be established. Why? The next reason is why. It would supply materials and in return it also made a market. The home countries would be relieved of dependence on other countries. So if England did not get its raw materials from India, it would have to buy cotton from USA, for example. They are able to produce it at a great profit and they would be selling it also at a profit back to India. Colonies are basically under the direct or indirect control. For example, India was indirectly controlled by the British East India Company and then later on directly controlled by the British Crown. Now let's look at the other point that is laissez-faire. The free markets in an economic sense or economic welfare, it is quite broad-minded. That means everyone should prosper, everyone should be given the chance to make a profit. Not only the government, not only the few businesses or the commercial classes. So what is laissez-faire? It is an economic theory from the 18th century. The origins are in France. The word itself is a French word, laissez-faire. It means leave us alone or let us do. So the point is that the less the government is involved in the economy, better business will be and it will also by extension affect society as a whole. This economics or laissez-faire economics or leave us alone economics, this is a key part of free market capitalism or capitalism even till today. In the modern era that we live in, socialism did not work, communism obviously has not worked. Capitalism is driving the economic market forward. In economics, three questions, what how, for whom to produce, laissez-faire says, let us alone, leave us alone, or let us alone, let us decide. The consumer will decide it. what to produce. The producer will decide how to produce at a reasonable cost and for whom. So for whom to produce is determined by the purchasing power. Now the command economy is very easy. Everything what, how to produce, for whom to produce is determined by the government. In a way, Laissez-faire, Adam Smith, let us produce, and the other side, command economy, John Maynard Keynes says the government should control it or decide it. The origin of the story is that in 1681, the French Controller General of Finances met a group of French businessmen and then he asked them how to do a business or trade properly. Leader of that delegation, Legendre, he just said, 
लेसे नो फेयर मीन्स लीव इट टू अस लेट अस टू इट क्यों बोल तांगे एडम स्मिथ वॉट ही डिड वॉज ओनली ही सपोर्टेड इट एंड रोट वेरी स्ट्रॉन्गली अबाउट इट पॉइंट पार्टिकुलरली इन दिस बुक कॉल्ड एन इंक्वायरी इन टू द नेचर एंड कॉजेस ऑफ द वेल्थ ऑफ नेशन नाउ ही रोट नॉट जस्ट अबाउट लेस ए फेयर बट सो मेनी टॉपिक्स द फर्स्ट सेकेंड थर्ड फोर्थ स्टेज ऑफ प्रोडक्शन ईच ऑफ दिस स्टेज हैज अ फंक्शन एंड इन दिस पार्टिकुलर यूनिट फोर वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट दिस इज द fourth stage or the final stage where everyone is interdependent on each other this book also looks at the consequences in a way it's like there's a modern economic bible it tells you the do's and don'ts and the pros and cons so let me wind up with john menard keynes and what he was all about john menard keynes born in cambridge studied at cambridge university a great mind a great person so as a great writer he influenced most of the european countries and even across the atlantic even in usa also between world war 1 and world war 2 he was an advisor to the british government and in usa he had a view of a planned economy which influenced the new deal administration of t roosevelt or theodore roosevelt after america and the whole world went through the great economic depression or the great economic crash of 1929 theodore roosevelt started the process of repairing or restoring the economy through the new deal it was a process where jobs were created the government put lots of funds and lots of investment in infrastructure building roads building highways building dams which employed a lot of people and in many ways i think this is what world leaders including in india all our lead political leaders should be looking into in this pandemic people are out of jobs including our teachers by the way that's very unfortunate not only just teachers practically everyone doesn't have proper source of income basically who has the maximum money the funds the government obviously and perhaps a few business houses so instead of reducing jobs they should be creating more jobs because ultimately when they don't have income of their own they will not spend and an economy let's say in the market economy that we are based in and how will the economy revive so you don't need to explain his theory in detail you have to remember these points and also remember the books that he wrote one is a book written in 1930 called a treatise on money and the next book the most famous book this is considered his best work it's called the general theory of employment interest and money his ideas especially about business cycles is most influential because he talks about cycles yes there will be a cycle of growth there will be a cycle of extreme growth it will just boom and then there will be a cycle where it will level out and it will come down again now these cycles are also common to pandemic so there's nothing really to be alarmed right now we are going through the peak or the boom cases are going up and up everyone is afraid but the cycle will stop it will pause it will level out as i say flattening the curve and it will come down so we just wait patiently it's like the weather the rain when it's raining very heavily it makes sense to stay inside the weather is clear we can all come out and live a normal life so that's all we need to look at it now john menard keynes i will not go into detail too much but just remember that he is also considered the founder of modern macroeconomics which studies the behavior and decision making of economy as a whole now globalization we it's very easy to look at the whole globe but in that globe we are also part of it is india part of asia yes is asia part of the world yes so you got to look at all the pieces which make up the economy or the globe as a whole so he started this okay let us come to the end of this session and the last concluding notes for today is that by the middle of the 19th century this free trade laissez faire overshadowed mercantilism by the way mercantilism has a certain function let's say during war or during a certain very difficult circumstances like in the pandemic that we are going now most businesses would be powerless the free trade economics will not work here the government has to intervene what to produce how to produce for whom to produce the state control over 
the means of production or over the distribution modes is only during an extraordinary circumstances like a war or a natural disaster or a pandemic when normal market economics don't work but in a normal situation the free trade or the less a fair let everyone do this should continue so in going back to england in 1846 the problem was there of corn it was too expensive there was not enough supply so when the law was abolished so food began to come in at a much cheaper rate so it actually was better for the economics why it's better because if you spend less money on food you have more money to spend on other things british farmers were hurt initially but overall it helped their economic growth they also learned to compete so uh, the result was good uh, overall in england when the corn laws were repealed and other western countries also began to repeal the high tariffs and the legal barriers which were there the result was that world markets grew freely and also you had non europeans also entering the world market and this continues even till today usa canada japan and now you can add korea china you can add india you can even add bangladesh vietnam singapore australia new zealand to that list it's an ever increasing list as countries go more modernized and advanced Okay lastly what laissez faire should teach you is to become a superstar in the free market economic superstars will always shine superstars are the people who don't need to be told what to do they know what to do they are committed they will do it the doers can also do but they have to be told what to do most of you are in that category i hope the next two other problem groups talker and problemers talk more work less pretend to do some work but actually you are not doing any work and problems are looking for problems na mobile it's ope lo le class ka jao lo de henge mobile kan jao pe but what do they do they are not joining the class they are just playing pubg I'm playing something else i'm happy tiktok is banned i don't know what they will look for next this is the, the thing about laissez faire which i hope you understand and this i leave you with this quote do what you can with what you have where you are this is a quote by theodore roosevelt so don't just depend on online class do what you can with what you have where you are your books are there in front of you the pen and paper if you don't have access to internet also you will have mobile network call me call your teachers ask them na sir ji to get tell it about them you can get the answer on phone also please also improve your writing skills this will improve your oral skills how you speak well how you communicate and ultimately even your answer paper that you submit in an, in an examination is a form of communication 